We're Hassani and Danielle Pettiford, and we're a real couple with real problems who almost called it quits. I was very frustrated. I became very disconnected, very um, jaded and, and cold. We have four children going on 20 years of marriage, and we practice what we preach. Our mission, to change the way couples relate to one another and teach them the skills needed to improve the quality of their relationships. This, this is the Couples, couples Academy, Academy Show. Show. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Hassani, uh, and you're watching the Couples Academy show. I am actually at a different location. We're here in Jersey. I'm in a hotel room. It's just the two of us today. Glad that you are joining us. I'm excited about today's topic because it is a necessary topic that we need to take the time to unpack to give both partners in the relationship clarity on how to move forward. We're talking about cheater's remorse, going beyond I'm sorry. I think that there are some things that we need to kind of walk through to really show you what I'm sorry is all about. And once those words have been articulated, what is next in the process of recovery? But before we get started, really quick announcement. As you know, the Last Chance Weekend is coming up March 11th through the 13th. Uh, we, we love the fact that we're almost there. We're almost at full capacity, but we do have room for uh, quite a few more couples. So please reach out if that is something that you're considering doing. It will be transformational for your life. Also, we're uh, open enrollment for Foundry, the 12-week path to manhood for men, and Unearthed, which is a 12-week path of self-discovery for women. So you could find the information in the links, just click on it uh, and feel free to register. We would love to have you be a part of these programs. All right, guys, we're, we're gonna dive into today's topic. We're talking about remorse. Now, here's the reality. Oftentimes, at some point, if not immediately, uh, when the affair is uh, exposed, um, the unfaithful partner will apologize, okay? Oftentimes, he or she will say, I'm sorry. Now, depending upon that individual, depending upon how much empathy they truly have, depending upon uh, their level of remorse, uh, their level of regret, whatever their emotional feeling is, wh wherever that person is in their life or in your relationship, either it will come across as a very sincere apology or it will be just something to say just to move on, right? And you can tell the difference oftentimes. And the reality is this. When we deal with our clients, typically speaking, uh, I don't know what the percentages are, but it is kind of split. There are those who have genuine remorse, genuinely realize and recognize what they have done, what the impact has been on their spouse, and they do the work. And we're going to talk about what that work is that a person who has remorse actually does beyond I'm sorry. But then there are those who don't who simply believe I'm sorry is enough. Listen, I gave you an apology. What more do you want me to do? I acknowledged it. I said it. All right, let's move on. Now, either they are a victim of one or two things. Either they're the victim of not caring or a victim of not knowing, okay? So giving them the benefit of the doubt, I'm gonna assume that they just don't know what to do. Uh, and that's why people go to counseling. That's why people need someone to help guide them through a process. Because oftentimes, you know, one of the uh, phrases that I hear many men in particular, not that women can't say this, many men say is, I just don't know what to do. Those seven words, I just don't know what to do. Either they don't know or everything that they're attempting to do does not work. And so they're in this stuck place of, I don't know what to do. So what I want to do is walk you through what to do uh, if you're truly trying to demonstrate remorse. Okay, first thing I think is important to realize that remorse is about showing, not telling how you feel. Because inwardly, you may feel genuinely remorseful. But it takes more than a feeling in order for her to receive what it is that you truly do feel. Because your feeling is inward. You live feelings on the inside of you, not necessarily on the outside of you. Now, what you feel has to intentionally be manist, uh, uh, manifested in what you show, what you demonstrate, the things that you do beyond. So let's just be clear, guys. Uh, you want to apologize. You want to express your sorrow and you want to do it in a comprehensive way, in a heartfelt, compassionate way that they can receive it, even if they're still in pain which we expect your spouse to be, 
your ability to articulate an apology the right way is critically important. Now, many people don't even know how to do that because in their apology, they're justifying, they're rationalizing, they're giving excuses as to why, and they haven't learned the true art of an apology. Now, we've done this show before, all you need to do is go to our uh, Couples Academy YouTube page and you can search through our videos, do a search for that title for you know how to apologize. And we've done several videos on that and I would encourage you to go back and watch that to know how to effectively do it. And even though you've done it once, maybe you've done it a hundred times, maybe you have done it wrong. So doing it again the right way can significantly help you, all right? So after you've given your apology, the question is, what's next? Because in essence, an apology, even when it's done right, it is simply not enough. We've got to go beyond, I'm sorry. So I wanna walk you through some steps. Number one, remorse is about the hard questions and the hard work. What does that mean? If you are truly remorseful, it is demonstrated uh, by engaging in difficult conversations or what we would call courageous conversations. It requires you demonstrating a level of courage. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is something you have in the midst of your fear. And oftentimes there's lots of fear associated with having these difficult conversations. The fear of hurting our spouse with the truth, the fear of what consequences we may face if the truth comes out, the fear of their emotional reactions. There's all types of fear, anxiety, and trepidation that people have. but when you're truly remorseful, you are willing to do whatever it takes to win the heart of your spouse back and to restore your relationship. And oftentimes, there's a season where you're gonna have conversations that center around this affair. And that spouse may ask the same question a hundred times, or they may ask that question a hundred different ways because you haven't been effective in answering the question. So prepare yourself, guard yourself, not guard as in protect yourself from your spouse, but, but, but in essence, it's almost like, you know, the scripture talks about putting on the full armor of God in order to wage war in the spirit realm. Well, there's an armor, not as if your spouse is your opponent, but there's an armor that you have to put on in order to engage in these challenging conversations in order to withstand it, okay? So preparing yourself for the hard questions is necessary, but then it's also engaging in the hard work. That is what the, the recovery process is all about. Now, we talk about the path to healing for the betrayed spouse, the path to healing for the unfaithful spouse, and the steps that must be taken in order to get to that a level of recovery. So it's, it's willing to stick in the fight. It's willing to stay in there. It's, you know, it, an individual who's so quick to throw in the towel, call the quits, just give up, a person who's constantly vacillating back and forth, do I want to do this, do I not? A person who's easily frustrated every time a question comes or a situation or a trigger comes up, you're not willing to do the hard work. This is a phenomenal book we always recommend, and it is entitled, What Radical Husbands Do. And in the first paragraph of the first chapter of the book, I'm going to paraphrase it. It says, listen, if you're deciding to stay, then be prepared to do the hardest work you've ever done in your life. <laughs> It's uh, b because it's not gonna be easy. It's, it's gonna be rough and some days are gonna be worse than others. And you gotta put your big britches on and be willing to stand in there and do whatever it takes because there are gonna be days where your spouse is gonna, uh, metaphorically speaking, wanna kick you in the groin, want to verbally attack you because they're in their pain. How do you withstand in that season? How do you get through that season and beyond that season to a better place? So it's, it's going to be a hard journey. And so if you are under the impression that I can just say I'm sorry and move on, you are sadly mistaken. It does not happen like that. And this is why we encourage you. Why would you do this thing alone? Find someone who's qualified to assist you. Because there are going to be times when you're going to want to cry uncle. There are going to be times when you're going to want to just throw in the towel. Now, when I say throw in the towel, I'm not talking about ending your marriage. I mean, throwing in the towel on the process because in your mind, it's taking too long. It's just too hard. We should be, be beyond this by now because you don't have the proper, proper context for what that recovery process looks like. We're talking about what to do to get beyond I'm sorry. Let's go to the next one. Remorse is about taking ownership and accepting blame. Now, we talked about this whole blame situation and how oftentimes uh, blame is thrown every which way. So whether it is the unfaithful partner blaming 
or the spouse or the betrayed spouse blaming blame goes around. But an unfaithful partner has to take ownership for his or her actions, for his or her betrayal, for his or her affair. Now, it is a fact that affairs happen for one of two reasons. Either something going on inside of the person who had the affair that wasn't good, wasn't right, and it led to the affair, or something happening in the midst of the relationship that created a vulnerability uh, for that person to have an affair or a combination of the two. But when an individual says, the only reason why I did is because you, well, that's shifting blame. Because the reality is, it doesn't matter what has happened relationally in your marriage, you made the decision to cheat. It was your decision. It was the way that you deal with problems. It was the way that you determined that you were going to handle the situation. So you've got to take ownership of that. You can't blame your decision on your spouse. Now, if you're talking about the dynamics uh, in the relationship that created the vulnerability, yes, we can have that conversation and need to have that conversation because if we're moving forward in the recovery process and if we've made the decision to stay within the marriage, then we've got to discuss, we've got to unpack the relationship issues because none of us, whether the betrayed or the unfaithful, want to be committed to more of the same that didn't work prior to the affair. So we've got to deal with the relational issues and establish a new healthy foundation moving forward, but that is a part two to your part one, and part one is taking ownership of what has happened, okay? Not blaming, because once you take ownership, at least it validates your spouse. They don't feel like they're crazy, they don't feel like you don't get it, they don't feel like you don't care, because you were willing to take ownership of what you've done. All right, guys, you're watching, um, uh, the Couples Academy show, we're going to go to a quick announcement. Stay tuned because there's so many more points that we're going to walk through uh, beyond. I'm sorry. Stay right there. Good morning, everyone. Once again, you're watching the Couples Academy show. Glad to have all of you here this morning. Just want to quickly recognize the family, Derek, Nina, Cali Power Couple, Shalice, JJ, Jackie. It's Robin's World, Lisa, um, Sandy. I can go on and on and on. Keith, but you are all here. I'll recognize you as we continue to go throughout the show. We're talking about Cheetah's remorse going beyond I'm sorry. And I want to read a couple quick um, comments uh, that I think are worthy to discuss and we'll get back to the points. Number one, good morning, my wife feels like I edged her on because of my remarks to her. Do you feel like the betrayed can have a part in the unfaithful cheating? Absolutely, 1000%. Is it right, is it justified for their actions? No, but as I just said, there are relational issues that take place in a relationship 
that can create a vulnerability within the relationship and within the person that will lead them to do what they did. Everything is attached. Nothing is done in isolation. So of course there is an impact, there is an influence. We've had people say, well, um, you know, hey, how about we try this or how about we try that? And they said it in jest. They said it when they were drunk. Their spouse took it seriously and decided that they were going to go and do their own thing. And then when the conversation about recovery takes place in those conversations, well, you did say or you pushed me or drove me to do it. Now, is that t is that blame shifting? Yeah, it's blame shifting. But I just want to let you know, if you are the unfaithful partner, and this is the hard truth, you can contribute to or influence a person's decision because of the pressure and stress that's happening in the relationship. That's not blaming you because the blame and the ownership has to take place on the part of the person who did it. But oftentimes we can be driven to do what is not good in a relationship. Like at the end of the day, if we're in crisis and we're fussing and fighting and screaming and yelling, if your reaction is to physically harm me because you were driven to that point, if my reaction is to cheat, well, both reactions are bad. What is within me that would lead me to cheat? What is within you that would lead you to hit? The reality is I, as a cheater, may never hit because it's not in me to do. You, as a hitter, may never cheat because it's not in you to do. Oftentimes, when we face pressure, what is in us is forced out of us. The pressure is forcing something out of us that is already within us. And so interestingly enough, there are times when a person who cheats, is cheating for the first time ever, never did it before, right? And we can kind of unpack that situation. But in many cases, if a person cheats, there is a history of it. Whether they've cheated on you or cheated on others, there was some breaking point within them they experienced it in the relationship and boom, it manifested in that person's life and in your relationship. A person who hits nine times out of 10, it's not the first time. It's happened before, whether with you or someone else, and they've reached the breaking point within the relationship and boom, that's how they react. Now, did you con contribute to a spouse hitting? Well, if we were in argument facing pre yet this it's a two way street. But the ownership and the responsibility and the blame has to be on the part of the individual who did it. So I hope that's clear. I want to be crystal clear in what I'm saying so that you don't miss what I'm saying. All right. Um, OK, here's another comment. I personally feel that the word but should be left out. I cheated, but you did this and that. I totally agree with you. Because when you do that, it's not received well by the person that you're kind of sharing why you did what you did. Okay, so let's go to the next point, guys. We're talking about what remorse actually looks like, all right? Remorse, remorse is about no longer being defensive. Now, defensiveness shows up in a number of different ways. Uh, when a person has cheated, a way that they can be defensive is by lying. We talk about the trickle truth and how so many people engage in these lies for a multitude of reasons, which we don't have time to unpack, but they're still lying. After discovery, still lying. After um, a recovery process, still lying. And so it's a form of defense. Another way of being defensive is gaslighting. People have a tendency of doing this all the time, and it's very manipulative. It's, it's giving a false impression. It's misleading or redirecting someone. It's, it's making the person question their own judgment. It's almost like turning the tables back on the other person. And so this is a, a tactic that either people unconsciously do and do it very, very re uh, well or intentionally do because they know the impact of, of, of gaslighting. And so if gaslighting is something that's, do, that's being done, it's a, it's a sign of defensiveness. Then blame shifting, as we just spoke about. And another way is stonewalling. And stonewalling is when you refuse to have a conversation or you're avoiding conversations for dear life because you don't want to get involved in it. Or you respond with the classic, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't recall, which is insulting. I just had somebody reach out to me 
this morning before our session and they said you know we've gone through the triggers class we, we've you know we've watched a lot of your videos and oftentimes when it's time to have the conversation my spouse doesn't remember anything like anything about the conversations anything about the affair they have drawn a blank is this possible and i would say absolutely not it is impossible that a person remembers nothing they're doing it because they're trying to avoid their own guilt and shame. They're doing it because they don't want to get into it because they don't want to deal with your emotional reactions. They don't want to deal with the consequences of, of you leaving. There are a multitude of reasons, but there is no way possible that a person remembers nothing. Now, it is very possible that a person doesn't remember everything. I think there's a difference between nothing and everything. It is, it, is, it is unfair for you to expect your spouse to remember every single detail of what has occurred because it's impossible. If that affair took place months or years ago, it's impossible to remember everything. Um, it's just, it's just not, I, and I give this example all the time. I'm driving in the car. I'm going to Michigan on the road, right? I'm focusing on the highway. I'm focusing on the GPS. I'm focusing on what turns need to be made. I don't see the trees on the highway. I don't see the beautiful houses. I don't see the. I don't see any of that, because I'm zoned in on something. So everything else could become a blur. Meanwhile, the person in the passenger seat has a different experience. They see everything going on. They're enjoying this trip. My focus is different than the person who's in who's in the car with me. Likewise, when we're trying to recall an affair, it's almost impossible for me to remember every single detail about everything that was going on during the time which helps to create the setting and give your spouse an understanding of the whole context of the affair. And so that's why it's important that when you're going through this uh, full disclosure process, you do it with someone that, who could bring balance to it. Because oftentimes there are questions that are very legitimate that the spouse refuses to answer and they're lying, they're omitting the truth, they're given a, a, a false impression, they're gaslighting. And then there are other questions that are completely unfair and is almost impossible for some people to answer. Now, the challenge is you are determining what you consider to be fair and unfair, and it creates more of a divide and a division with your spouse. This is why we encourage you, find someone who can guide you through a comprehensive full disclosure process so that he or she acts as an advocate to the both of you. So by the time you have the, that conversation, it's a comprehensive one, there's more clarity, there's more closure, and you can close that chapter, move on in the recovery process. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's go to the next point. Hope this is helping you. And we want you to share this because this is some good information. There are other people who are struggling with this right now, and you could be an advocate for them by sharing with them what they need to get through their situation. All right, let's go to the next one. Remorse is about emphasizing, I'm sorry, empathize, it's, it's spelled wrong. Remorse is about empathizing without minimizing, okay? So oftentimes we talk about this. People use the language of minimization when they say it was just, it was only, I never felt, it never was, we never did. So you've become an expert on what it wasn't instead of what it was. You've become an expert in articulating how it was no big deal and so what you're doing is as you minimize, you're forcing your spouse to maximize what has happened. When you minimize what you've done and make it no big deal because you didn't love her, it was only one time, it was just this, not that. When you do that, what you're doing is you're almost subconsciously saying it was no big deal. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't an egregious crime against my spouse it wasn't sin it just happened and so the reality is it can happen again because of how you look at it right so i, I give this example um, my wife had a colleague years ago that she worked with and this particular person was very serious about his diet i mean super duper 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 serious and so while we could look at a burger and fries and a Coke and say, it's just a meal, no big deal. You know, I'll eat and work out and it'll be fine, right? Very cavalier approach to fast food. This particular individual said, there's no way I'm eating that. And he literally believed that if he ate a French fry, he would die. 
<laughs> you see the you see the thinking and the philosophy philosophy and the approach that he had towards fast food like th 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 there's it's completely off limits i'm not doing it because if i do i am going to die and so i'm using that as an example to say when we look at our behaviors our betrayer betrayals our our affairs as ah oh, it's no big deal it wasn't all that i mean it wasn't that serious then what's keeping you what what will help you to build a conviction that you should never ever do it again because in your mind if it was no big deal what you're really saying is i don't understand why my spouse is struggling with this the way that they are because it really wasn't a big deal so now their reaction like shouldn't we be past this by now shouldn't we shouldn't we have moved on from this by now and that is what's so unfortunate about the person in the position who's done their harm because they have not really realized the devastation that they have caused as a result of their no big deal actions all right let's go to the next one remorse is about taking the initiative i think this is a really good one because oftentimes it is the unfaithful i'm sorry the betrayed spouse who takes the initiative so examples of taking the initiative would be reading books it's interesting how the betrayed spouse becomes like a phd <laughs> on infidelity and 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 the unfaithful spouse the one who did it barely got their ged it, it's because he or she hasn't taken the time to really study to really know to really understand what he or she has done if he or she did it would change their philosophy, their perspective, the way in which they deal with and respond to and approach their spouse, because then they would finally get it. So taking the initiative to learn about what has happened is critically important. So whether that is done through reading books, whether that is done through uh, watching videos, reading articles, or somehow learning however you choose to about the affair, it would be very helpful for your own understanding, your healing and recovery, your spouses, and your collective restoration. Uh, but also taking the initiative when it comes to making appointments to seek counseling. Why should it be the betrayed spouse? Because if the betrayed spouse is leading everything, they have this feeling like, I'm on my own. I'm doing all the work. We wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't for me. And, and that's a very that's a very painful feeling and isolating feeling to have when this has been done to a person rather than it being let out by the person who actually did it. So set up the appointment, reach out to us or whomever you choose to go to, but find somebody who can truly help you through your situation. Another way of initiating is initiating the conversations. It seems like the only time we talk about this affair is when my spouse brings it up. And it's just like, oh, here we go again. Do we have to talk about this again? And it's very off-putting to your partner. But when you initiate and when you say, babe, listen, how about we talk tonight? Hey, babe, just checking in on you. How, how, how are you feeling? How, anything you want to discuss? Anything I can give you clarity on? Do you know what that does for your spouse? It makes them believe, at least, that you truly care and they're not in this on their own and they're not suffering by themselves. What you do and how you show up in terms of how you initiate these conversations really helps to bring about healing in your partner. Let's go to the next one. Remorse is about patience. We say this all the time. You cannot control the pace of your spouse's recovery. You can't do it because it would be self-serving. For you to say come on now come on come on seasons up we we listen we, we got things to do we got places to go we you need to get over this now <laughs> that's going to create more pain in your spouse and trust me it's going to have a negative impact on your relationship neither should the un, uh, betrayed spouse control uh their recovery process did you hear that i'm saying that the person who cheated shouldn't control it and the person who was cheated on should not control it because sometimes you want to slow it down you want to come to a screeching halt you want to live in your pain because there's benefits to it now nobody wants to experience the pain but living in this space and being the playing the role not that you i don't mean that condescending condescendingly but you're playing the role of the victim your spouse is now playing or fulfilling the role of the victim of the of the uh, villain right now as long as you remain in that space there are benefits all types of benefits now they're self-serving benefits it doesn't help you heal it doesn't help you move forward it doesn't help you restore your relationship 
And so you can't control your pace. Working with someone who is a coach, a counselor, a therapist, and submitting to their wisdom and their methodology will help you get unstuck out of the pace that you would normally be in on your own, helping you to move forward at a much more faster pace, not too fast, because it is a recovery process, but you're not doing it by yourself. Therefore, you're not relying on your own wisdom and expertise to get there. And as long as you have people who you are accountable to, and so does your spouse, trust me, that is the sweet spot that'll get you through what you're going through. Last but not least, guys, how does one show remorse? Remorse is about living honestly, right? And when we talk about the policy of radical honesty, there are many components of it, but what I'm talking about now is what we call current honesty, where I'm open and honest and transparent, not leaving a false impression, uh, not going dark, uh, where I'm gone for hours and you can't reach me, I'm available to you whenever you need me, and being open and honest about how I feel, my thoughts and my feelings, and being willing to have honest conversations. Guys, when you do these things, it will win the heart of your spouse and contribute to their healing. Listen, I hope you enjoyed what you heard here today. That was 30 minutes of power of fire. I want you to watch this with your spouse. I want you to take the time to go through it, write notes. These comments that you're leaving, if there are questions, we will pick it up in part two on tomorrow. Guys, I love you. I hope you get something out of what we do daily. We appreciate you for being here. See you tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh,